if I tell you that I'm an industrial designer, what is your first thought? If you think I design beautiful factories, <laughs> you're wrong. In fact, industrial designers are behind almost every single project, product you use on a daily basis. For example, who here in the crowd owns a toaster? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few people. Now, who owns a bicycle? Okay, not so bad. Difficult one now, I want you to think. If you own or use on a daily basis a toothbrush, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> oh, I better see all hands raised up right now because otherwise your seat neighbor will be very worried, like yours. <laughs> see, an industrial designer created these objects for you and so much more from the shoes you're wearing to the cars on the street. And that goes through learning every single manufacturing process and material available for production. Now, I'm sure that by the end of my talk, some of you will want to become your very own product designer, the maker of things surrounding you. Let's start at the beginning. As you may know, most profession at some point in its history has been revolutionized by a new tool or a new invention. The sewing machine boosted the clothing industry. The tractor changed the face of agriculture. And photography reinvented art and documentation. All of these innovations at one point in common. They were getting the job done faster. For industrial design, this game changer came in the early digital age with the invention of CAD modeling, a computer-aided design tool that allowed the creation of digital drawings, which ended up being one of the keys that allowed thousands of technologies to emerge, one of them being additive manufacturing. A technology you might know better under its common name nowadays, 3D printing. So there's many additive manufacturing technologies in use today, and they all share boring three letters acronym, like FDM, SLS, SLA, SLP, DLP, SDL, LOM, and so on. Can continue like that for an hour. They use different tools, like lasers, extruders, blades, transforming different materials from UV-cured resins uh, metal powder, and even paper. But they all share a similar function. They add thin layers of material on top of each other to create 3D objects. So building this way has three major advantages over traditional processes. First of all, you don't need a mold, which can represent a big investment. You can actually produce completely unmoldable parts. Imagine the design freedom that enables. With the same machine, a thousand different, a thousand different parts can be produced without having to modify it a bit. This is the closest opportunity we got to real mass customization, where industrial products can be tailor-made to the client's taste and needs. Second, Articulated objects can be built without any assembly. The different volumes are just built simultaneously, but they keep their, move their movement independent. Last but not least, with the concept of distributed manufacturing, an object can be built remotely in any place equipped with a 3D printer and electricity. This virtually means no packaging, no transport, no storage. Basically, no middleman between the designer and the final user. 
For the first time, these two can interact and give each other feedback to make the product better. Now imagine a world where whenever an object breaks, you just have to go to the manufacturer's online catalog and download an improved spare part. Now doesn't that sound awesome? <laughs> Does it seem too good to be true to some of you? Well, I'll be totally honest with you guys. There are some downsides to 3D printing that I haven't mentioned yet. As some of you may have guessed, since each layer of material is so thin, the manufacturing process can be very slow and quite expensive, which is perhaps one of the reasons why, for the first 25 years of its existence, 3D printing has been mainly used for product prototyping until the arrival of small, affordable, and open source 3D printer from the RepRap project. So these small machines were built from standard components and 3D printed parts, mostly by engineering students and some hobbyists. But this is where the game changed again and where people like me come into this story. As a young industrial design student in 2005, I was well aware of 3D printing and what I could do with it, but it was way over my budget. The machine owned by my school was a $30,000 machine. A single spool of material would cost over $300 each, which made no sense to make a product out of that. But by the end of my university education, you could find machines at one-tenth of this price, allowing young designers like me to own one. As I was doing my final project on the subject of DIY in the digital age, it only made sense that I would explore the possibilities allowed by a 24-7 access to one of these 3D printers. So I managed to get one, and I installed it in my living room which didn't please my girlfriend. <laughs> to put you in context, back then, the most popular 3D printing file you could find on internet was a plastic Yoda head. Yes, the character from Star Wars. Hardly the shape of things to come. For my first project, I wanted to use this technology as a way to extend the life of products by giving them new functions. I looked around and I realized I had a lot of glass jars in my kitchen that I wasn't using. I decided I would design special lids for them to give these objects new purposes. They became birdhouses, dumbbells, piggy banks, and even hourglasses. The project had a huge success on the internet, which is when I realized that it was one of the first times somebody had thought of a domestic application for these new desktop 3D printers. I still use some of these objects today, like today. 3D printing became a real addiction for me. I started using it everywhere on all type of projects. I used it to help my father fix his boat. I even used it a lot of times to improvise birthday presents I had forgotten about. <laughs> like this time I made an iPod case for my little sister and it said, my big brother is awesome. <laughs> cool. In June 2012, the IKEA lampshade in the middle of my living room ripped in half, beyond repair. It was one of those $40 regulate a lot of students have. Changing the lampshade would have cost pretty much the size of the whole set. So I decided I would make my own. I made a design on my computer and sent it to the 3D printer in the evening. The next morning, I had a brand new lampshade, which was quite satisfying. But I repeated the process once and twice and ended up making a new design every evening for a month. <laughs> my apartment was filled with lampshades. <laughs> I didn't want to stop the project there, but I had way enough lampshades like that. So I decided I would share my process and make a tutorial that I would share on the internet 
I've put it on my online portfolio. The next morning, I had an article in Wired. My mailbox was filled of people asking me where to buy these lamps, which was a huge problem because I only had one tiny 3D printer and a single lampshade took me 12 hours to produce. <laughs> I never tried to find a way to cover the demand because at this exact moment, I knew there was a bright future ahead for me as an industrial designer specialized in design for 3D printing. We were at the very beginning of what became a global phenomenon. And I spent the next four years trying to bring this technology out of the prototyping zone and into the functional object world. Ironically, today and since the past two years, the most popular and liked 3D printing file you can find on the inter internet still is another cute and kind of useless toy. At least this time, it features some of the 3D printing best assets. The toy is hollow, which means less material use. It also prints this way in the 3D printer. No support, no post-processing. You just take it out of the machine and it's ready to be played with, legs and head. Outside of these features, I have no clue why people love this little elephant so much. <laughs> but I, I'm glad they do, because, well, I'm the one who designed it. <laughs> now, everywhere I go in the world, people present me I, as the guy who designed the elephant. It even became uh, our mascot in the office. Since I became creative director of LaFab Shop, I started using this technology, 3D printing, on a large amount of projects, many being additive manufacturing researchers for large companies. But some of, some of my side projects, the ones I did for fun, are those that had the most impact on the way we see 3D printing today in our daily lives. They go from parametric connectors, allowing people to make their own modular furniture, to fun and open source toy concepts, inviting kids to play with vegetables <laughs> before they learn how to cook them with their parents. <laughs> to me, some of the, the most meaningful uses for 3D printing are those that such as the human body. This is often done with the help of 3D scanning. When you combine 3D scanning to 3D printing, you can easily produce custom orthopedic insoles from flexible materials. Also, custom earring aids can be produced at a better price. 3D scanning also has a huge potential for fashion and haute couture, like this modern corset following the exact curves of a, a very specific woman body. To tell the whole story, it was a Valentine's Day project I did with my wife, and the gift was for me. <laughs> Perhaps the most impressive applications of 3D printing are those that changes the body itself. You might have heard of this college student who 3D scanned and 3D printed his own teeth to build a series of clear orthodontic aligners. This kid literally designed his own smile for only $60. While such custom medical equipment can cost thousands of dollars. I know this smile didn't come like this way. But <laughs> my parents had to pay a lot. There's also initiative like Enables, which started by 3D printing custom 3D printed hands for kids born without their fingers. This concept was adapted for war amputees in South Sudan, even for people missing a single finger. 
One of my favorite projects was done very recently by, by a friend. He designed a special prosthetic leg for a Paralympic cyclist. And she will be using it in the 2016 Rio Games. And I'm sure she will kick everyone's butt. <laughs> I could keep talking for hours about how we can use 3D printing for complex medical applications, like reconstructive surgeries, or for the production of artificial organs. I could also try to explain you how we manage to 3D print complete houses and even functional cars. But what I wanted to show you with these examples is that 3D printing goes way beyond industrial design. It has the potential to revolutionize architecture, archaeology, medicine, and even cooking. Not only because this technology exists, but because its whole ecosystem is becoming available. Today I'm asking you, if you had the, the possibility to build anything, anywhere, what would you make? Thank you.